second, 2015, at nearest CISG 1.3, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 9 into week number 5. And this morning, I have already released the teacher's message this week. But before we get to the teacher's message, let's take a look at it. The theme is self-regulated learning, and we have already stepped into learning contract number 2. Learning contract number two came of the study of the core topics of this course, information security and privacy. And today we will come back to the issues of privacy and also introduce to you the idea of encryptions. Okay? So um, let's take a look at the differences between self-regulated learning and inquiry-based learning, the difference between the two learning contracts. The first learning contract is inquiry-based learning. Now, many students will have the impressions that inquiry-based learning is self-learning. Well, it's independent learning in a specific format, which will help develop in you the ability to inquire about something, and that something are topics in this course. And we kick off inquiry-based learning, the first learning contract, with a specific form of practice that is called the online journal based note-taking have to go through the three-stage process. The first stage is observations. Okay? If you look at examples I released last week on the work done by students in the past semester, and you understand observations means if we're taking notes from the given source, and we take notes by citing the sources, pinpointing some points of importance that you believe are very important, and then we move to the stage of interpretations. Interpretation means asking essential questions. What are the essential questions you can identify based on the topic of interest you have selected and based on the information you have basically processed by capturing what you believe are important points of interest. So the last stage on that particular um, process of inquiry-based learning in the process of this course is applications. We ask the questions, what can we learn from what we have done in the context of look taking in the context of questioning? Uh, have we found enough information that would make sense for us to put together, to put together the stories of our own, which will be useful not just to your persons, but to bodies around you? So application asks for the questions of how can we make something useful for people that we have learned, that we've spent time doing it in the context of my interest. So inquiry-based learning builds you up in the process of learning of the first four weeks, the steps in observations, taking things out, the steps in interpretations, asking some essential questions, also getting relevant sources, and finally, come back to the questions of what have we learned? Can we share that something with our folks around us? And in the process of doing that, in the very last week of the first learning contract, we introduced to you the idea of information literacy. The context of information literacy could be summarized into five important stages. The first is you have a need for information. The second, you know that you need for information, you go ahead to access the information. And once you have access to different types of information, you need to come to evaluate the information to see if they fit into your own purpose or specific need. And finally, you discover a lot of good information that is very good, very compatible with your need, so you use the information. And so we say that before, you publish what you're supposed to publish, make sure you give credit to the sources of the information. That is an ethical practice. So we say need, access, evaluate, use, and ethics. These forms the principles of information literacy in today's world. And then we also introduce to you a very interesting process of doing information literacy by coming down to the steps D for define what you need. I for inquire about what is important. 
S stands for searching what you need. C stands for collecting what you believe are important. O represents organize what you forgot. V verify what you got. E express what you got. And R put together some of thinking in the context of reflection. And that is the discovery process of information literacy. And towards the end of Don's grid, we'll also introduce to you the idea of managing a small research assignment, asking what should you do to choose a topic, what you could do to narrow down topics, and what you could do to discover information on the topic, and where can you do that? In a library, electronically, doing it through the internet search engine or the specific databases from the library. Okay. So here we are. We believe that we have given you enough foundations on the inquiry-based learning process, including inviting you of your submitted learning artifact to create a questionnaire for yourself. Now, for those of you who have already finished the questionnaire, welcome, okay? For those of you who have not finished the questionnaire, make sure you finish the questionnaire before the end of today, okay? It's going to end today at 11.55. And for those of you who have already finished the questionnaire, if you leave me a message at Dr. Wet's Q&A hotline this week, week number five, okay? So you will be given a small credit for doing this questionnaire, and a small credit will be counted towards the score you are going to receive uh, in the first learning contract, okay? Uh, Sometimes it's equivalent to a journal score, all right? And Yes, that you will be rewarded for doing that. But do it honestly because your feedback is very important. So your questionnaire is here. Just come here and get the questionnaire done before the end of today at 11.55. All right. So now let's go to week number five. Remember, after you have finished the questionnaire, if you give me a message, if you, it's not necessary, if you give me a message, okay, right here at Dr. Ben's Q&A hotline, at week number five, that tells me I finished the questionnaire for learning contract number one. As I said, I will reward you with a small score, which could be count towards the score you're going to receive for learning contract number one. Okay? So that is one way to reward students for doing something. Now let's come back to day number nine. The, um, the first thing we need to introduce to you is what is meant by SRL. Okay? So self-regulated learning, it's a very important lifelong skill which should have been taught, as far as you are concerned, studying from primary school. And my kids doing primary school and also secondary school have already stopped doing the SRL. So what basically what SRL means is you need to learn how to set goals in your study. Okay? Now you set goals in your study by choosing your major. You want to finish your college education in a specific major because you want to do something following up with the expertise you're going to acquire during the college year. And that is a big goal. Now, but besides this big goal, when you do college year by year, you should also learn how to set goals for the first year, the second year, the third year, and finally the fourth year. For example, at the end of the first year, you need to learn how to behave not a college student who have visions for their accomplishment. Well, one thing very important is to set goals in SRL. You need to set your learning goals. And once you've set your learning goals, you need to be realistic, okay? Realistic in the context of how much resources do you have to accomplish the goals? Uh, for example, uh, you, you cannot do anything without any specific resources. And one example of the very important resources, time, okay? We don't have all the time we have to do what we want. So in the context of your college educations, not only you're given four years time to do it, you cannot do it in 10 years. Well, someone did it in 10 years. Well, if they have a job, and they have a family, and they do it like this. But normally, a college education is just four years. So we just take four years of time concern. And what about a course? Okay, a course is normally one semester long. So one semester is normally three months' time 
oh well, yeah, we call it 14 weeks <coughs> semester. So you have to understand that if you come to college, you have to do course-based learning, and each course is supposed to be 14 weeks long. So that is the time resources you have to get something done. Okay? So Self-regulated learning possible rights that you need to set goals for individual course-based learning and you need to learn how to connect the goals in individual courses so as to integrate your learning at the end of a semester-based learning after you've already done so many courses. You need to learn how to hook up the knowledge together to become something useful for you. Now that is something you have to do. But as an instructor, we need to help you in the context of doing a course-based learning, to set goals for this particular course. Okay, a course that is 14 widths, for example, you can take a look at the Buddha environment, have already set some specific learning context for you in each of the week. And in the specific context of the first learning contract, we went through the first four weeks and we have already touched some of the essential topics there. Now, at the end of your learning contract number one, you have already done some very good things in the context of learning to pick up the journal writing in the context of note taking using the old IA format I just learned, I've just given you. Well, old IA represents for a specific training to develop in you a mind to think about what should I do with a specific topic given the time I have. So, when I say resources, you have to set goals alongside with the important resources you have, the time. How much time am I going to do this? And after that, you have to set away, set aside some of your energy to apply to the time to complete the works there. And so the third important thing besides setting goals and understanding your time dive is to come up with a plan, a work plan to accomplish your goals with the time you have. A work plan in the context of understanding what is required of you at the end of a specific uh, period of time or specific homework and what you're going to accomplish at the end of that specific time. So you listed out some of the specific job you need to do in the work plan, for example, at the end of the second learning contract, which will be about one month away, you need to deliver another set of learning contract, uh, learning artifacts. But this time, well, you have to do it mostly with your learning partner and also mostly with teammates, because this time it's mostly team-based work together with peer-based work supported by individual work. So, goals, time, Work plan and then evaluations of the work plans. How am I going to evaluate at the end of the period? No, you need to let your uh, work plan divided in the milestone of your work. Now, in the first learning contract, all the way forward this time, I've not mentioned that, I just take it as an introduction. But in the second learning contract, I must remind you, part of the SRA is how you're going to set the milestone of your work to be accomplished. Now that this is the very first day, this kick off the second learning contract. If you look at the calendar, it will be about one month away, uh, including your human being here. So what you have to do is to set some timeline with the milestone. And for each milestone, you have some specific goals to accomplish, okay? And then ask yourself how much time you're going to devote to that because this is only one course you have to do. And indeed, you have to apply the same sets of management skill for every course. Self-regulated learning includes a lot of the management skill. Self-management, okay? How you're going to manage yourself and apply the same set of management skill to your their care work, to your teamwork, and then all the members will share the common goals. So if you look at today's teacher's message, which is week number five, you will understand that I've already given you 
a big picture of what you're supposed to encompass in the context of self-regulated learning. I divide this into four specific main points, and I call this the task management skills, okay? You need to learn how to manage your learning in the context of tasks to be encompassed. So first of all, you need to learn task analysis skill. Task analysis skill is basically to ask yourself the important question, what does this assignment require of me? So what needs to be done? Okay, you need to ask yourself this question, what needs to be done? Last week, uh, exactly last Monday, I introduced to you the ideas that at the end of this second learning contract, you need to submit something similar to the first learning contract, except that the teamwork proportions will be higher, and at the end of that, the whole team need to do a story in the context of creating a digital story um, by combining the learning from individuals, from the two pairs, and all the team members. Now, what does it mean to ask yourself the question, what needs to be done? You need a timeline of conditions, you know the time constraint, okay? The time constraint, you know, you know how to break the task into manageable <coughs> parts, okay? What I have to accomplish, for example, you need to accomplish the journal, okay? That is an individual work. If you need to accomplish a discussion forum that in involves, in the first learning contract, two persons work. What if one person is not willing to help and always disappear or never got in touch with him or her. So what are the ground rules you need to do to make sure the process works out smoothly? And the first thing is that when I play your goals and a framework to activity, <coughs> and you also need to understand at the end of your work, who is going to read my work? Is it just a homework assignment or the teacher give me a score? Or is it a piece of writing that you're proud of so that I can really share that with most of others and publish in my blog? So you need to understand how what you're going to do in a second learning contract compared to what you did in the first learning contract, okay? Have you ever checked it for your score by using the rubric? Uh, have you ever understood uh, what is required of you and uh, basically what can you do? So if we want to ask the important questions again, we need to understand what resources do we need to get the job done. And the ability to do it is definitely <coughs> just the information literacy skill we mentioned last week. Can you identify the resources you need to get the job done? And the second thing is, can you develop a plan of actions to get the work done? And this plan of actions will be created by individuals in your team. Okay, remember, last week I invite you to form a team by combining two pairs. Have you ever started working on that? If not, in a minute, I'm going to give you time to do that. And then, taking actions. Once you have actually identified the resources and come up with a work plan, you need to act on that. Okay, acting on the plan means bringing forth the resources you have understanding how useful the resources are, checking the resources with the specific goals you have set down, and then come up with conclusions after you have already monitored the progress. Now that is a very simple way to manage something. Managing something means I set goal, I put in some time, I come up with a work plan, I act on the plan, and before the end of the period, I need to monitor the progress and I need to check if I'm meeting my goals. If not, you don't just stay there. You change the plan, okay? So you need to change the plan after you have already done some assessment of the actions. And that's the reasons why you need to have team meetings, virtual or physical. If I have been assigned for work, which I have to do, and I have to produce the work before the end of the milestone. And if I have not done that, now assessment will indicate no, we failed to achieve the goals. So you need to be more alert to the needs of the team. Because if we fail, if the whole team fail, if we succeed, the whole team succeed, now 
take the item to the world. So, task analysis include identifying what you need to do with a timeline with the resources, identifying the resources, and understanding the work plan that has to be ironed out, act on the plans, come up with a monitoring scheme, check the progress, if not, re-evaluate after you have changed the plan to get the job done. So in a matter of three to four weeks, you should have at least two or three milestones that the whole team of persons to put together the work done already and then ask the questions, have we met the goals? Now, we still have to use the skill we got on the first planning contract. We all have to do OIA, we all have to choose a topic, we all have to do discussions, pair wipes, and then team base. And then we have to come up with a report. For example, in a specific team, not only we have two pairs, and if each pair come up with a topic, that pair has to write a report for that topic. And so in a team which contain two pairs, again, the, the report contain two topics, just like in your first learning contract. But in the first learning contract, you have two persons, and each person's come up with a topic, so your report has two topics. But in the context of this team-based assignment, you have two pairs in each team, and each pair come up with a topic, and write a report, and each report has two topics, one topic per pair. All right? So, and then, but as far as the block is concerned, in the team-based assignment, you have four persons per team, so each person is still responsible for writing a personal block based on his or her contributions on the specific work done in the second learning contract. Okay? So, what does it mean to do SRL? That means you need to have a system. First, everyone in the team should be aware of the learning goals, common acceptance. Second, everyone in your team should be aware of the time resources you have, at most four weeks. Okay? Third, Everyone in the team should be aware of the work plan the whole team should agree to work on. And the work plans include divisions of work among the individual member, divisions of work among the two peers, and that's a whole how you're going to collaborate versus cooperate. <coughs> cooperate means if I have a big task, I divide it into task A and task B, each one of them is going to take up a specific part, for example. I'm going to take up A, you're going to take up B. So don't worry about A, I'm going to handle it. But I will not worry about your people who are going to handle it. You only inform me at the end of the world. But when you do collaboration, is different. Collaboration is, if we have a big task and we divide it into A and B, both you and I will be involved in A and also involved in B. But when we talk about A, we can concentrate on A. When we talk about B, we we'll concentrate on B. That is, throughout the process, all of us will be informed of the progress. So, collaborations and cooperations. So, you have to understand the meaning of teamwork. Um, then, you also need to understand the evaluation scheme. The evaluation scheme includes setting up <coughs> ground rules for team members to follow. If I am a member of a specific team, I must read the ground rules very carefully. The ground rule, if I happen to violate, I need to be responsible for that. For example, if I'm supposed to be always here during physical meeting and I happen to be absent without any excuse, then you have to be responsible for that. The team member will give you an evaluation. Okay? It's very important that you learn this kind of white lifelong learning skill, responsibility. And then, when you come to monitoring, monitoring means uh, when you come to a meeting, okay, the agenda always start with follow up, <coughs> follow up with what we are supposed to get finished when we come to this meeting, and someone is going to give a check or pause on the specific work done by the individual member. That means what? You have a follow up, you have actions to be taken, and you have the details of the plan uh, to be checked uh, for your specific work to be done. Um, for example, if you have three physical meeting time, you have to do three sets of such meeting minutes to check the progress in four members. Oh yes, let me see if I remember that very important things. Um, 
you have, you have to understand that you have to work in a team. A team does not work in a, in a loose couple manner. Team is going to have a structure. That means um, in one team, which includes four persons, normally we invite you to define the roles of individual persons. For example, we have a team lead. That means a person who is going to coordinate all the actions. We have a secretary in the team who is going to take the minutes for the team. We have a project tracker, the person who's, who's doing the, do all this kind of chasing after you to make sure that you finish the work done. And the person who's going to liaison with all the members, remember to all the way meeting so that you have to produce something. In a team, we have different roles like this. And sometimes, one physical person is taking up more than one role. And also, when a team comes to, to present something, you must have a reporter, and you also must have a, an MC or something like that. <coughs> uh, you have to know that. Oh, yes, most importantly, uh, some of the team will designate one writer for the team. The writer is going to write all the reports with all the resources gathered by the team members. And then you also might have an editor uh, who's going to edit what's been written uh, before the submission of something. So, and also a presenter, a designer, a reporter, um, the timekeeper, right? So you have to think about the roles in the context of getting the job done. And also, since I mentioned the digital story to be produced by each team, there ought to be someone called a producer, okay, and a technical need who is going to bring together the different levels of expertise in the team members. So you have to learn to work in a team, all right, in a secondary contract. You have two specific contracts <coughs> to practice your skill to do team-based project work. This is just the beginning, so it's a warm-up exercise in the second learning contract, and we will continue that in the third learning contract. And when that comes, we call this problem based all right? So, it's a step-by-step -step process. So make sure you study this message very uh, clearly. Uh, it's not complicated, but it's the kind of skill <coughs> you can reuse them in other courses. Because in college study, it's very seldom that you're going to do your homework individually. No. Almost 90% of my college years we have to do team-based work because we need to learn how we work with people and sometimes very difficult. What if your member is not willing to cooperate in you know, some of the problems that we encounter as a teacher, some of my marriage counselor, uh, they come together very easily because they have the name of living papa, and then they experience the difficulty of working together, and we have to sit down with them and talk with them. So you have to learn something about this, and in this particular GE course, it's also an important skill that you need to Besides just the knowledge, all right? So let's go back to this week, date number nine, all right? So this is date number nine in week number five. So if you look at the topic, we're going to say um, today privacy and encryptions. First day is web attacks and internet vulnerability. So let's get started with privacy. Have you ever felt like prying eyes are watching you as you surf the internet or log on to various social networks? Well, it's probably because they are, at least according to our guest today, who says not only are they watching you, but they're also collecting your personal information that can be later used against you. I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is Lori Andrews, author of I Know Who You Are and I Saw What You Did, Social Networks and the Death of Privacy. Welcome, Lori. Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. So first of all, let me just say that this book does a great job of raising awareness about online privacy. I mean, really, is that the reason why you wrote it? Absolutely. I had no idea until I started researching it that dictionary.com puts 233 tracking mechanisms on your computer when you look up a word. That increasingly, people's online self is more important than their offline self. And 75% of companies now require their HR officials 
to look at what you are online before offering you a job. To look at what you're doing online and the second stuff that is built online, correct? Yes. And so, um, you know, think of poor Ashley Payne, 24 year old school teacher. She hadn't fretted any of her students or any of their parents. She went to Ireland on a summer vacation, posted a picture of herself having a beer at the Guinness factory, and lost her job as a result. Uh, increasingly, judgments are being made against us, and we might know, hey, maybe I shouldn't post that drunken hot tub picture, right. but people don't realize that even something like a smiling photo might be used against them. One woman was hurt in a workplace accident, had four spinal surgeries, and a judge actually said she couldn't have been that hurt if her MySpace photo showed her smiling. Didn't wow. even ask whether the picture was from before the accident or not. So this is being looked at as the real self, and you know, and, and people are losing custody of their children. Well, yeah, this to is fascinating picture. because I think we all understand that when we join Facebook and other social networks, that maybe some of the information we disclose will be used by advertisers to better target ads. But to have that information used to sort of adversely affect us, I think, is incredible. Yeah, you know, people don't realize that their email over Gmail is scanned. So if I over Gmail say to a friend, I'm thinking of getting a divorce, or if I do a Google search for old guitars, and then I go to a credit card site, I might be offered a less good credit card because people getting divorces or who are in garage rock bands uh, tend not to pay their bills. Wow, but who's scanning this information? You know, there are algorithms for the companies. I mean, Google makes $36 billion a year. 96% of their income is based on using your private information to match you to advertisers, and people think, oh, I love getting the 10% off coupon or finding out where my favorite band is playing, but they don't realize that information can be used in negative ways. Um, so, you know, I write mysteries in addition to nonfiction books. I Google things like date rape drugs and so forth. Whole criminal cases have been based on people's Google searches. So, I mean, it's data aggregators are collecting this information, and it's not just about people who are on social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter. It's just anybody is vulnerable, and anybody is at risk if you're using yeah, the internet. Absolutely. So, say you do a search for the side effects of a medication. It might not even be for you, and you're doing it for your friend or your grandmother. Then you go on a life insurance site. You might not be able to get life insurance because you have looked for that information or you've looked at certain websites. And people think, well, I'll clean up my Facebook page. I'll take down incriminating photos when I go right, looking right. for a job. But some companies actually keep the last seven years worth of public Facebook information. And their business model is to sell that information to employers. And I've seen some of the Oh, uh, the reports that have come out of one company called Social Intelligence Corporation. So if you had an underage drinking photo six years ago in college, they will mark it as illegal activity and the potential employer will just get a report that said you behaved illegally. Or one guy uh, on Craigslist was trying to organize an effort to legalize marijuana. That was marked as illegal activity and sent to the employer. Well, and so there are going to be some folks, Lori, who say, all right, I get it. You know, they're collecting information about me, but I really don't care. So what do you say to those folks who, who don't care? Why should they care? Well, they may not care because they just don't know that it might mean the difference between getting a job or not, getting a credit card or not, or keeping custody of your children or not. A sexy photo on MySpace for a woman could actually could lose her custody of her children. And courts are looking into things now like, is a dad a bad dad? Should he lose his kids because he liked the viral video of Burger King shooting Ronald McDonald in the face? So everywhere you go on the web now is coming into court cases. And it's turning the legal system upside down. In one case, a criminal case, a juror actually posted the facts of the case on Facebook and asked people to vote up or down yeah, about I whether it was person that. That was in jail. Yeah. You know? So I think that, you know, you, increasingly you are what you post. And so you might not think about it now, but there might be later decisions in your life about um, custody cases, about divorce, about criminal activities. Los Angeles, the LAPD, charges kids with gang activity if they're wearing gang colors on their Facebook or MySpace page. Well, I looked at the list of gang colors, mm -hmm. plaid, 
think any of Yeah, everybody wears flat. I wear, wear flat even. So. Yeah, all black. You know, and so you can be discriminated against in ways that it's hard to fight against. Because unlike things like oh, credit bureaus who might give a credit score of yours to a company when you're looking for a loan or a credit card, the data aggregators who are selling information about you don't have to tell you that that's why you were turned on for a job. They don't have to let you correct it if they have out-of-date information. One poor guy can't get a job because his dad had his, has his same name. The dad who's deceased had a mugshot up from when he was younger mm. for, a, for a simple misdemeanor. But now the person with the same name doesn't even get a job uh, because of this other information that had been about his dad. Employers are asking for your password to your Facebook page in order to look at the private side of what you do. Maryland has passed a law against it, but other states are still trying to catch up with that. Okay, now I want you to do a very important exercise now. You've heard seven minutes on these interviews at Rupert's Law, and what I would like you to discover from the interview now at this point is to remember as much as you could, or better say capture as much as you could, the issues or examples given by um, the interview on the issues of privacy, online privacy, and what were the small case study you remember about the significance of this online privacy issues. Uh, I remember very clearly it is not so much what we do online, Okay, everybody has Facebook, but it's very much intent on what people are doing to collect information from people like us who have interactions online using social networking media like Facebook. What can you remember? Now, if there is a need, definitely I'll come back to pray you the video at the end of the discussion. But now, try to remember, uh, try to capture what I mean this observe from the particular video what you can understand and try to discuss with your member. Now let's do a five minute exercise, okay, including remembering at least one interesting fact or important by the interval on each one of you and share that with your papa next to you, okay? We have five minutes time to work on that. You can talk, you can, you can discuss, it's time for sharing. Help yourself, okay? Um, the scuffer. Because that is one important thing we can learn together. Remember, the issue is privacy. We first visit issues like this in the first week. Now we revisit it almost never. Okay, go ahead and talk about it. It's your time, five minutes. What do you remember? What's the greatest immediate precious to you? It's, it's very important. It's Anyone you want to choose.
Yes, if you believe it's important for you to review the video during this discussion time, go ahead and review them uh, using your mobile devices. Yes. So, the kind of exercise we recommend you to do in class help you to develop your immediate way to process information and learn how to ask questions. It's not meant to memorize what you have seen, but to provide some basic um, OIE skills into understanding some issues. Okay, let's get started. Maybe we start with the ladies here. You want to help us to understand your perspective? Hello. Hello. Help us to introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, my name is Annie. Hi, Annie. What do you think after watching this video? Mm -hmm. I think the interesting point is uh, the company can know the interview in the social way. Okay. Uh, for example, um, when the interview um, like something in Facebook. Okay. But that thing is bad when the company know that and they can change. Okay. That means they can actually do some kind of personal checkup of the person's online history. Uh, based on his uh, likes or the slide from Facebook and use that as the basis to to say I'm not going to hire you because you did something online like this before All right. so that is very surprising because we never know who's watching us but someone is actually keeping data of our history and it's a very important I think it's a crime sometimes to get our data like this because otherwise there's no need to set up an office of personal data um, privacy in Macau, right? So, thank you, thank you. Could you pass the microphone to someone uh, next to your... Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Hello? You want to say something? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think sometimes maybe we don't really care about if others know our privacy, but okay. actually we should pay attention to it because right. your, your information you post online, maybe someone will uh, use them against you and may lead to uh, something you don't want to have. Right. Yeah. So you see, relatively recently, Facebook would like each one to sign up using Facebook to use the real names, okay? So that it uh, creates some kind of anxiety in regions like Hong Kong and even China, okay? Uh, I think it's because Facebook would like to be properly introduced in China, so they have to make some compromise or something like this. Okay, could you pass the microphone to someone? Hello? Yeah. Okay, okay. You can pass it to Timmy. Hello? You have some ideas? No, we don't have something to share. Okay. So would you, would you uh, a surprise when you go for an interview someday and they just give you a fat say no because we know what you did in the intellect? Do you think it's fair to do something like this? Uh, not fair, because this is our privacy. Yeah. Uh, I think they shouldn't uh, know without us asking yeah. us. But the question, but the, the the fact of the matter is, suppose you finish college, okay? You go to apply for a job, or you go to apply for a graduate school somewhere, and the the company. They're looking at your profile and say, no, we're going to hire you because we know that in uh, five years ago, uh, you, when you were doing Facebook, you did something like this and we don't like it. And you will be surprised, right? Because something, someone is digging up your, your data without your knowing. So what can we do about this? Do you have any idea? No, okay. Can you can pass the microphone to say Billy or Wyson? Hi. Yes. She's talking about one point is about the, some social media company may might sell your informa your personal information right. without without um, asking you. Yes, they won't ask. Yeah, they won't ask. Just like and um, just like before Facebook have the same issue. Okay. So that we when we play or play games or when we watching the we are watching the Facebook, you can see some advertisement. But in the, those advertisement, you can see that um, your, your friend or your, your data is on, on the advertisement. Right. So, so this, uh, I think, is um, the important thing to okay. think about if uh, the, the Facebook really protecting our privacy or okay. they just sell, sell uh, our data to the company. So they can use the data to uh, make some advertisement and others. Okay, I think uh, you've also given us another very interesting examples that uh, we became targets <coughs> or images associated with different Facebook advertisement. Okay, so uh, could you pass the microphone to someone? Uh, you, do you have anything to say? It's okay if you uh, are not ready, you can just pass the microphone to someone. Yeah. And Lancy? Uh, hello. Um, I think it is a very big contribution between um, social media and our privacy. Yes. Uh, because like Facebook or WeChat, um, we often use our true name right. to find our old friends. Okay. So if we don't put our personal information in the, on it, we can't find them. Right. And when we put our photos or uh, some interesting things on it, uh, we like to share our life with
raised by parents. Yes, yes. Uh, so it, it's very uh, it's unavoidable to yeah. uh, put our privacy uh, into in, on the internet. Right. Uh, so the problem is we don't know whether there are some people bad would take advantage of this information to do some things. Okay. Um, so I don't know how to deal with this problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there is very interesting things uh, discovered in the interview, but uh, from the viewpoint of what they are going to do, uh, or better say, what they have already started doing in China, I think uh, it's also important that they are setting um, a kind of atmosphere that people must be responsible for what they are doing online, uh, just like we have to be responsible for what we're doing in the society, because everyone is going to be protected by the law. And if you violate anything, you will be, um, in one sense, accountable. Now that is a very good direction. But on the other hand, a lot of the very interesting phenomenon happening in the internet. Now this is the case reported in North America, okay? And I think it's a free country. Uh, normally in a free country, they do not uh, register anything with the real name sometimes. But when they talk about a specific case, like you go for a job interview, and the company say they would not hire you because your record online is not pleasing to the company. Now, what, what does it imply? It implies your real identity is actually discovered uh, by someone uh, online doing something that is not good for the companies. Uh, the, so. <coughs> It does not have anything uh, concerned with um, false identity. But it's just a matter of, yes, you are using real identity, but your privacy has not been protected enough because things like this are not supposed to be reviewed to the public. But somehow it was reviewed to the public. Now, the, what are the reasons? Now, some of the reasons could be attributed to ourselves because just like in the first lessons we say, we share the material. Uh, without thinking good enough that whether or not we should share. And once we share that, people can look at it, right? Or well, from the other point of view, someone uh, did something to discover our work, work record, even though we did not share that. So that is an issue that we need to talk about. Okay, can you pass the microphone to say Anna or Sammy? Hello, Sammy. Okay. And I think it's um, very correct because sometimes maybe we are not realizing that, but uh, others, um, especially those who are not familiar with us, they will just look at your uh, online some records and then to uh, to tell uh, what kind of person you are. Yes. And this sometimes to make some misunderstanding between people. Right. And there is a big issue, I think. Yes, I think you make a very good point, too. Maybe we listen to Anna's first before we try to comment on this. What do you think, Anna? As far as I'm concerned, I think uh, it's media's uh, responsibility to keep our uh, information privacy. They have to um, respect our privacy, even if we post our uh, picture to the internet, it doesn't mean that we uh, permit everyone to use it as a resource freely. Um, and the government uh, should make some laws to, uh, about these problems. Yes, I think uh, you also make a very good point. That's why in Macau, we do have an office of personal data and privacy, uh, just um, uh, to do what they could to protect our right to privacy. Uh, but in the real world of internet, because basically it doesn't have any boundary, when uh, it's it's everywhere, right? One is online, is everywhere. Sometimes if um, someone did something bad for us, but they are actually not living around us. They live 
all the world apart from us. And how can we do something to stop them? So it's something very hard to handle. That's why it's uh, globalization. And have you heard about the enhanced great war within China recently? In China, right? They have the great war. But what I'm talking about is the great war to fend off electronics contact. Okay, now they didn't enhance the portions. Okay, so even uh, you, you try to crime over the wall with software, it's not that easy now. So uh, they're trying to do something uh, to secure China from the outside influences. And they're interesting, it's been about hundreds of years ago in China. China did something similar to seal off the border, <laughs> to defend off all the interactions. But no, we're not talking, we're not trying to associate the two things together. In some sense, this, this creates some kind of anxiety, that's right, okay? So I think it's very interesting to hear all of you express your thoughts. Now, they are not for us to learn uh, in this particular video. Let's try to give you um, the second part of the day, which is encryptions, before we invite you to do something. Today, with companies transmitting an increasing amount of information over the internet, more and more sensitive business data is put at risk. It's now easier than ever for you and your employees to send information from a laptop, phone, or other computer anywhere you go. And that also means that your data is more open to attack by hackers and thieves. Managed service providers and IT management companies use a variety of methods to help keep critical business data safe, including data encryption. These companies use data encryption as an advanced security tool to ensure the protection and confidentiality of your important information. So what exactly does encryption mean? Data encryption is a key part of any business's IT security plan. Simply put, encryption means to put data into a kind of secret code in order to protect it and disguise it. Only a person or a computer who understands the code will be able to decipher the information. In terms of data protection, encryption is vital in keeping your confidential information protected and secure. When you send sensitive information such as credit card or bank account numbers over the internet, you want that information to be inaccessible if it gets into the wrong hands. Therefore, encryption works to hide this information from anyone who shouldn't have access to it. Codes have been used for hundreds of years to send sensitive information. Today, computer-generated algorithms are guides for encryption. They provide a way to create a message and secure it much more effectively than a human-created code. When it comes to encryption, there are many different levels available. In general, the higher the encryption level or complexity of the code used, the safer your information will be. High encryption levels protect you against brute force attacks in which thieves or hackers use a computer program to simply try out various combinations of characters to see if they are able to crack the code. Higher levels of encryption increase the number of possibilities that must be tried to access a particular document, account, or file. So, 128-bit encryption is much more secure against brute force attack than a 40-bit encryption, and a 256-bit encryption is stronger than 128-bit. When it comes down to it, data encryption provides an important layer of protection for a business's data. Encryption technology is available for both on-site and off-site storage, providing peace of mind and security for data regardless of where it's located or what happens to it. Working with a professional IT services company like ours will help ensure your data is properly encrypted. Contact us today to learn more about keeping all of your critical business information protected and secure. Now, since our time is running out, so the point that I invite you, invite you to continue um, getting yourself equipped with the basics of encryption by watching the follow up videos on our website, part two and part three. And for those of you who would like to understand more about the issues of privacy, now explore some of these political things, okay? Uh, because it has been discussed as an international issues and academic and also government oriented at the same. Now, before I do roll call for today, may I remind those of you who did the sharing last week, remember, go back to last
comes to its public discussion forum, create a record of your sharing here, okay? I'll give you some guidelines. You need to type a very simple record. Day, for example, number eight, 2015, January the 29th, and then brief descriptions of your sharing. Um, the, the best is to include a very simple PowerPoint with a couple of slides, including what you sent in the resources, and then the YouTube link, which is already available online through the Google environment. Inside the YouTube video, from which minute to which minute is your appearance, okay? And at the end of that, if you have some PowerPoint or YouTube video or whatever, it is included in your discussion front here. It's important because you need that record towards the end of the semester to frame your score. And so much better you did it before the end of the week when you did your show. Okay? So may I invite both Sammy and Anna to do it? Okay? To make sure you create records in week number four because you did it in week number four. Okay? And I've also sent our call for participation for this week. So those of you who would like to do sharing this week on Thursday, make sure you stay up in week number four's call for this week's um, sharing. You see that I've sent out the call from yesterday, okay? So let me go back to do the uh, roll call. Um, and then those of you who have not done the questionnaire, make sure you finish the questionnaire before the end of today, okay? And again, you need to give me the team compositions, okay? So send me which two pair become one team from all the possible pairs now in this class, okay? It's important. <coughs> and the sooner you get it done, the less time you will waste because today is the first day of the second learning contract. And in the second learning contract, you need to work in team, okay? Angel is here. Jack C is not here today. Uh, Horace is not here today. Andy is here, right? Thank you. And then Edna is here. Andy is here. And then Billy is here. Gaius is here. Uh, Timmy is here. Wyson is here. Sammy is here. And then Lancy is here. Sophie. Edward, thank you. And that's it. All right. So we we'll see you again on Thursday. <coughs> now, please study very carefully for those of you who does not seem to understand what you need to have first. The second learning contract, go to submissions, okay? And then once you get to submissions, Submissions and click down to artifacts for learning contract number team uh, number two. And there you can see a similar set of artifacts you need to produce by the first set, except with a little bit more details. Okay. Remember, you have to produce a specific digital story as the team based story towards the end of the learning contract number two. Okay. So, yes, that's it. For today, I see you on Thursday. The link is already there, okay? Yes, I'm just going to back here. Yes. Right. Okay. So, if you have a question, definitely you can stay behind and ask a question. And that's it for today's CISG 113, Section 1 Information Security and Privacy, day number 9 into week number 5.